I moved into my first ever house four months ago. My dad owns several real estate properties in the area, so he's been letting me rent it out ever since I turned 18. It's a small, one-story house that sits on a side road just off of a busy street. The surrounding houses are pretty close to each other, but most of the backyards are decently sized. Ever since I moved in, I haven't really met or talked with any of the neighbors. It seemed like most people kept to themselves, which is something I'm totally fine with. Everything seemed perfectly normal for the first couple months, until I got home from work on a late Wednesday night. It had been snowing heavily for the entire day, so unfortunately, I had to go out and shovel the driveway. I was exhausted, but I couldn't rely on my siblings to take care of it like I used to. I'm the only girl among three older brothers, so I've usually just guilted them into doing it for me. Now that I was on my own, I bundled up and made my way back outside as soon as I got home. I let my five-year-old poodle, Duke, out of his cage so that he could go outside with me while I shoveled the snow. Duke's favorite thing in the entire world is snow, and I could tell he was excited as soon as he stepped outside. He has a shock collar that keeps him in his boundaries, so I never have to worry about him when he's out. While I was outside clearing off the driveway, my neighbor from across the street, who I hadn't met yet, came outside with the snowblower. He noticed me right away and started walking over. I stopped what I was doing and said hi, as he held out his hand and introduced himself as Rob. He was bald, skinny, and wore a gray newsboy hat. Would you like me to help you out with the driveway? I said no thanks, but he ignored my response and brought his snowblower over. It was a very kind gesture, and I thanked him as I got back to shoveling. Once we finished, he offered to make me tea or coffee, but I politely declined and walked back inside after thanking him again. He definitely seemed nice, but something about him seemed to be missing. His actions were endearing, but his personality felt like it didn't line up. He showed little emotion, but would make odd jokes and laugh at weird times. I guess I just chalked it up to him being a little awkward, because after all, he did just help me with the entire driveway. I went back inside with Duke and showered, then lay down on the couch to watch Netflix before bed. Once I was about to pass out, I let Duke outside one more time to do his business. The snow was continuing to fall heavily, and the icy wind was whipping around, making it feel way colder than it really was. I noticed that Rob's entire house was completely dark, having no lamppost or spotlights to light up his property at night. His garage door was now closed, but I could see a dim light shining through the small garage windows in the center. I was still getting to know everyone on the street, so it didn't really strike me as anything strange. I went back to my room and fell asleep, before I was awakened to a loud noise coming from outside my house. I wiped the sleep out of my eyes and grabbed my phone, checking to see what time it was. It was 2 a.m. I sat up in bed and leaned over to peek through the window curtain. I couldn't believe it. Rob was outside plowing my driveway again. His garage was open, and the light from inside illuminated a good portion of my driveway. It was way too late to be doing such a deed, so I slipped on my shoes and walked outside to the front porch. I tried waving at him whenever he'd be facing my direction, but it was like he didn't even see me standing there with my front porch light on too. I walked down the driveway and kept trying to get his attention, but he basically acted like I wasn't even there. Once I was within feet of him, he finally stopped what he was doing and looked up at me. He had a confused look on his face and acted surprised when I said, do you mind stopping? It's too late and people are trying to sleep. He looked at me like I had just verbally abused him and replied, oh, okay, you're welcome anyways. As to why he was getting mad, I don't know. I felt like I had the right to be at the very least annoyed but I stayed composed and thanked him in a kind tone anyways. He kept the same blank expression on his face, and after uncomfortably staring at me for a couple seconds, he turned and walked his snowblower back. I walked back inside, and as soon as I began to shut my door, I saw him walking back down the driveway, this time with the shovel in his hand. I stepped back outside and asked him if he minded not doing anything else tonight, but his response genuinely freaked me out. He stopped in his track and stared at me, before saying, you'll wish you hadn't said that. Hearing that left me speechless, and I stepped back in before closing and locking the door. Duke was standing at the screen door the whole time barking, definitely sensing that something was wrong. Instead of having him sleep in his dog bed in the living room, I brought him into my room to sleep with me for the night. Before laying down, I looked out the window one more time, and he was gone. The garage was closed, the lights were off, and the house went back to looking like a blank sheet of darkness. 
As I was on my phone, trying to get comfortable before I slept, I got a call from an unknown number. It instantly creeped me out, and I let it ring until it went to voicemail. Seconds later, I got a voicemail notification. I put the phone up to my ear and only heard static before it was interrupted by the sound of breathing. The voicemail was only 10 seconds, and the person on the other line never spoke a single word. It all lined up too closely together for it to be a coincidence that some random person called me in the middle of the night, and I instantly thought back to Rob. After a sleepless night, my paranoia was at an all-time high. The entire night, the wind continued to whirl around the house, making creaking noises that only added to my worries. The next morning, I was beyond tired, but I still had to go into work. As I was taking the trash out before I left, I noticed a track of footsteps on the side of the house that were definitely not mine. That horrible feeling I had the night before came back, and I was able to follow them since they still looked somewhat fresh. The footsteps looped around to the back of the house, where they led up the deck, to the back door, and back down, before leading to every door and window of my house. Without a doubt in my mind, I knew it was him. I ran back inside and called my dad, telling him everything that happened. He came right after and helped me load up all of my belongings, and I moved back home that very day. We considered calling the police, but we decided it would be best not to, especially since I was moving out anyway. We didn't want to upset the wrong person, which in this case was my psycho neighbor, and I was perfectly fine with leaving and never coming back. My husband and I have lived in the same house for over a decade now. We specifically moved into this area because of two main reasons. One, it's safe, and two, it has an excellent school system. My daughter Lily, who's seven, loves to play outside with some of the kids in the neighborhood. She has a neighborhood friend group of about four or five, and they're all very nice kids, including their parents. An old couple lives right across the street from us, and my husband and I like to refer to them as the neighborhood vigilantes. They're always the first to find out the inside scoop, whether it's with the neighbors, the city, or just about anything that has to do with general neighborhood gossip. Don't get me wrong, they're very nice people, but I seriously don't know how they find out the stuff they do. Anyway, our neighbors directly next to us had moved out, but we still hadn't met or heard anything about the new neighbors that moved in the week prior. I was out in the front yard one night kicking a soccer ball around with Lily when the old lady from across the street was just getting home. Lily and I gave her a wave, and she walked over to our yard. This wasn't an uncommon thing, and we'd occasionally chat whenever we saw each other. Since I was obviously curious, I started asking her if she heard anything about the new neighbors. She told us that it was a single man in his late 60s named Chester, who was a retired teacher. Other than that, she didn't really know much about him. None of us had really seen him, other than the first day he moved in, when he was bringing in boxes. We agreed to text each other updates if we ever met or talked with him. Well, weeks passed, and it seemed like nobody in the neighborhood had seen this guy. On this particular night, Lily was out in the front yard playing with two of her friends, and the sun was just about to set. Once it was time to send everybody home, I stepped outside and told them they had to wrap it up. The two girls each left, and I went back inside with Lily. I asked her how her night was, and what she told me was deeply disturbing. She told me that she met the new neighbor, who apparently came outside earlier in the day when they were walking by his house to get to her friend's house. She explained how the guy stepped outside, walked down the driveway, then asked the girls if they wanted to come inside for lemonade. Thankfully, they were all smart enough to say no and walk away, but this really gave me a sickening feeling inside. I texted the lady across the street letting her know that there was a problem, and she was soon filled in on the issue. When I had Lily tell my husband what she told me, he was furious. He stormed out of the front door and walked over to his house and pounded on his door while I told Lily to stay inside and followed him over. The lights in his house were on and his car was in the driveway, but he wasn't coming to the door. He was definitely home. If this was someone we knew well and trusted, we obviously wouldn't have reacted this way, but since neither of us hadn't even met him, he was crossing a serious boundary. The word soon got around the neighborhood, and I ended up meeting with the parents of Lily's neighborhood friends. We agreed to all be extremely vigilant of that man, especially when our daughters were outside. Well, not too long after that initial encounter, something else happened. 
I was in the kitchen one night while Lily was over her friend's house when I got a call from the parents. Hey, you need to come over right now. Everyone's fine, but we need to talk about something. Worried, I got in my car and sped a few houses down before pulling into their driveway. When I got there, the parents were standing at the door. I anxiously walked up the driveway and they invited me inside. The girls were in the basement and they asked me to sit down on the couch in their living room. That's when the mother spoke up. She said that the girls were playing in the front and she'd been out there the whole night with them. When she got up to go inside for a few minutes to prepare dinner, the man came walking by with the dog and he let the girls pet it. The mother, still having no idea, came back outside a few minutes later to see that the man was just inches away from Lily, taking a picture of her and his dog. She quickly told her husband and they confronted the man, who was surprisingly confrontational, denying he ever did it and acting like he did nothing wrong. They told the man to leave and brought the girls inside just before calling me. As soon as I got back home, I called my husband who was working late. We were able to file a restraining order on Chester, but unfortunately, that was all we could do. It doesn't really make a difference when they live next door, and we certainly didn't feel any safer. Although we don't want to leave our home, my husband and I have agreed that we have to move. Since that night, I've caught him looking out the window multiple times while walking Lily to the bus stop in the mornings. It's not safe for her anymore, and if he's already been this aggressive and obvious about his interest with little girls, he's not going to stop. I live in a suburban neighborhood surrounding a very affluent city. Many of the people who live in my neighborhood are either big business workers, engineers, or medical professionals. I was about 15 at the time the craziness started happening, and my younger brother was still in middle school. I live on a small cul-de-sac with other families who had kids that were around my age. Directly across the street lived a man. His name was Bass and he lived with his wife and young daughter. Bass was an engineer for a local company and he was very friendly for the first year he lived across from us. We even invited him and his family to our cookouts and neighborhood gatherings because at the time he seemed like a normal guy. Somewhere along the line, people on our street began to see strange things happening at Bass's house. The lawn was never cut, the pool wasn't cleaned, and his wife and daughter would occasionally leave the house for long periods at a time. We would all see Bass drive off in his sports car, but his family was rarely with him. It turns out, Bass had some sort of mental break, and he threatened his wife with a gun while he was intoxicated. When issues like that arose, his wife and daughter would immediately get out of there. During a freezing cold winter night, I woke up to the sounds of police cars, fire trucks, and ambulances. Considering I live in a small neighborhood, I rarely see any emergency vehicles in our area, maybe the occasional cop for a noise complaint from our older neighbors, but that was it. It happened around 2 in the morning, so I groggily got up and went to my window to see what was going on. My heart immediately sank. Bass had gotten drunk again and purposely buried himself in a snowbank naked and refused help from authorities. We all felt bad for Bass because he was such a nice man when we met him. But somewhere along the way, it seemed like he just snapped. Fast forward to that following summer, Bass's drinking problem had gotten way out of hand, to the point where he lost his job and license due to multiple DWIs. I was home alone, babysitting my brother and the next door neighbor, because both of our parents worked and my brother was good friends with the neighbor's kid. Around lunchtime, a cop pulled up to our house, saying that Bass had taken a car, drove it around the neighborhood at alarmingly fast speeds, and was possibly armed. He was arrested for owning unregistered weapons prior. Apparently, he heard that the cops were coming because so many of our neighbors complained, so he ditched the car and was last seen wandering through the woods behind my house and the neighboring houses on my side of the road. You know that feeling when you reach in your pocket to find something and it's not there? That stomach dropping sensation? I had that times a thousand. The cop told me to call them immediately if I saw him go back to his house, so it sounded like he completely got away from them. After the cop left, I went into panic mode. I locked all the windows and doors and informed my brother and the neighbor to call the parents and fill them in on the situation since they were still at work. An hour passed and my brother and his friend were just sitting in the living room watching TV and I was in the dining room so I could keep looking out the window. At some point, I noticed that the trees along the side of my yard were moving, almost as if someone was trying to push through them. I immediately told my brother and the neighbor to get away from the windows and stay quiet. As soon as I said that, 
I saw Bass stick his head out of the trees, spot me in the window, and run back into the woods. I immediately called the cops freaking out, telling them that he was still hiding in the woods in my backyard. Bass knew what my parents' car looked like, and since they weren't in the driveway, he most likely knew that I was home alone. I was relieved that he was at least back in the woods again, but knowing he was still close was unsettling. For the hour following my call to the cops, there was no sign of Bass until he appeared in my backyard walking out of the woods. I was freaking out again because the only thing between me and Bass was a sliding glass door. I was in the kitchen, so I ducked behind a countertop. I eventually peeked my head up after a minute and saw that he was just looking at my door from about 20 feet away, just staring and not moving. After about 10 minutes, he ran to the front yard and that's when I noticed that he had something in his pocket. I wasn't exactly sure what it was, but he kept his hand close to it while going into the road and locking himself back into his garage. The cops came, but since he was back on his property and they had no evidence other than the neighbor's account of him driving through the neighborhood, they really couldn't do anything except give him a warning. It was his word against the neighbors at that point. Years went on and he continued to become more and more psychotic. He would often lock himself in the garage where he had stocked up large propane tanks and had planned to light a match which would have completely blown the place up. Luckily, the next door neighbor smelled the gas and they called the cops and the fire department immediately. They went in wearing full hazmat suits and were able to retrieve him from the garage. During my junior year, he ended up just randomly disappearing. Rumors started spreading around where some people thought he was either in a mental asylum, jail, or with his mother who came to take him out of state. The house is still empty to this day and it honestly looks really creepy. Nobody really knows what happened to him. I still live there today, but I definitely sleep better knowing that Bass isn't there anymore.